It is Saturday, the 23rd of January, 2021, and this is the future of photography. My name's Chris. We have Jeremiah, we have Adrian, and Imar excused herself for this episode. Should be back soon, though. Um, how's everyone doing? We are surviving. Yeah, hanging in there. <laughs> yes, yeah, not too bad, thank which, you. Which so is a, a nice real plus today. at this point. You, you know, you know what? The, the, our our pre-show discussions here before we record i really enjoy those just just some 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 other people outside of the little circle i'm 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 in right now so <laughs> this is the extent of our social life <laughs> yeah it's well, a bit yeah, limited it, yeah it is it is but i don't know about you guys but you know i tend to end up feeling reasonably content with with what my with my lot in life I, I i sort of my expectations shrink to the lowest common denominator so yeah, easily it, pleased i think i've been probably. getting into being agoraphobic now if i just go out for a second i'm like <laughs> oh what is this whoops whoops <laughs> travel uh, well travel around the block so so um hmm, try, trying to build a bridge here into the topic of the show i think it's a bit too uh, dimensional. It's, cut, it's a bit do. no, no. It's a bit. It's a bit too dimensional what we have right now in terms of That's our social right. life. We have so to expand our thinking. We need to add a bit more depth here, right? So yes, every, everyone at this point has has read the title of this episode anyway. Uh, Jeremiah on three D. That's the title. So Jeremiah, your uh, turn. What are yeah. we going to talk about? You know, I I think fundamentally uh, we could talk about three D. Is it uh, distracting? Or is it a kind of forward-thinking technology that will uh, create kind of new experiences in image making? So it's distracting. Next topic. Yeah, it's the overall. Thing. Okay, <laughs> over to you. What's I our think next it show? Deserves a bit more discussion than that, Chris. Um, <laughs> okay, tiny little bit. Sorry, sorry. You know, uh, you know, uh, we can go through. You know, the from the very, very beginnings of, of photography. Once it really got its sea legs in terms of uh, technology, uh, the very first thing that people started to experiment with was three D yeah. racy pictures. So uh, we are, we are. <laughs> but this is this is the point where I remind everyone that this is an audio podcast with a video attachment to it. So um, in the show notes, you'll find I, a link to the YouTube video and. Jeremiah has just held up some... Um, uh, I will describe it. Okay, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> it, it, it is, uh, it is um, an image, or it is actually two images paired together, printed on one uh, photographic sheet that is applied to a cardboard, one representing the left eye version and one the right eye version. And they're generally looked at in a contraption where you slide it in, look through a couple of lenses, and that will give you a complete 3D view of these images. They were very popular uh, at the turn of the century and even a little earlier. Um, so they were as much a novelty as they were uh, used for documenting, you know, uh, um, landscapes and uh, digs in Egypt and all of those kinds of colonial ways that that uh, the English were very um, uh, kind of proud of. <laughs> so uh, stereoscopic 3D uh, has been part of, of the photographic process almost from the beginning. Um, as it evolves, uh, it becomes uh, just more and more um, I guess, easy to take 3D pictures, but not as easy to view 3D pictures. Um, as the process uh, becomes more popular um, in terms of photography, we have uh, many different cameras um, by many different manufacturers. And, you know, I invite anybody to Google the history of 3D cameras. There's plenty of them with two lenses and whatnot. And, and, um, all kinds of contraptions for viewing. It never really caught on. Um, and uh, it, it was always kind of a niche product. Um, and there's reasons for it. Uh, personally, uh, and, and I'll get into how it evolved in a moment, but um, I always look at 3D uh, the same way that I, I look at color photography. Um, you know, the root abstraction of photography is very, very intriguing to me. And that's why I, I tend towards black and white 
Um, not that I avoid shooting color, but I, I do. Um, but but color is its own thing. Uh, you 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 frame something. You you want to capture its essence. Um, adding 3D to that uh, creates another experience. Same image, but are we looking at the 3D uh, at the depth of it, um, or are we looking at the image? And and that's something that as someone who's uh, experimented with uh, film in 3D, uh, never made a 3D film, but I, I have participated in uh, Paramount, brought in a bunch of us directors to work with the latest technology several years ago uh, with a, a, a team and, and uh, just to explore the kind of thinking one applies to image making, both in motion and still. I just found that the technology was the tail that wagged the dog. And I've seen very few films that wherein the 3D technology enhanced the story. One was uh, the invention of Hugo Cabaret by Martin Scorsese. The other one was Dial M for Murder uh, by Hitchcock. But I really can't remember other films that use 3D in an effective way to enhance the story. I have uh, one, actually. Yeah, go. Just the one, though. No. Um, it was a film called 3D Muppet Vision. And I saw it at Disney World in Florida in about 1998, perhaps. And you went into the theatre and the theatre was set up like the Muppet Theatre, right? The, from the old TV series, including with the characters in the box at the top and stuff like that. And uh, but when the curtains opened, it wasn't a theatre stage. It was a it, it was a screen and you had a, a 3D Muppet extravaganza, uh, including, if I remember rightly, I'm sure this isn't there anymore. So it's not a spoiler to say that like bits of the physical theatre actually blew up at the end in the finale of the film. Um, <laughs> it was it was fantastic but it was the it's the only the only use of 3d in a film i've ever seen that i thought added to the experience <laughs> was it the 3d or the dimension that was the entertainment or was it the story that or was the or were they recreating a 3d uh, a, a theatrical experience uh, and used 3d for that so that, those are all good questions. Um, it was a very long time ago. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so any memories I have of it, of course, are, are somewhat, are somewhat um, yeah, faded at this point. I think that, that I remember being impressed by the way they, yeah, the, it, it, the first couple of uses of it were designed to sort of shock you and, and, and make you leap in your seat. Uh, but after that, the, the, it, it became part of the story. And so, the, as I say, the finale, there were physical bits of the theatre falling apart or, or, or whatever, you know, in those way, in the ways that, you know, um, Disney World rides do. Um, uh, and that was combined with the 3D visuals from the screen. So, so I would say, actually, it, it was a pretty sophisticated especially for its day, a pretty sophisticated blend of the 3D technology and the story and physical special effects. Well, Avatar does that uh, very, very well as well. Um, oh. You know, Cameron did that. I think. Somebody had to say Avatar, didn't well, they? Well, well, the use of the 3D in that fan fantasy realm, I think, really uh, helped the experience, shall we say. I didn't, I didn't see it in 3D, actually, and it's a film I didn't enjoy. So I'll, I'll probably not, I'll, I'll not take us down a rabbit hole by, by, you know, just being miserable about what was clearly a very successful movie. Well, I saw it in 3D IMAX, and that it was the way it was intended. And, and uh, it was kind of astonishing. I mean, you know, the story is effectively Pocahontas, but the, 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 experience of seeing cinema in that way was it felt new and it felt kind of refreshed however uh back to the issue at hand as as uh, the 50s came up something that was uh or became very popular is something called the viewmaster um viewmaster i'm holding up a little viewmaster um viewer and uh, one would put these circular discs in and they were generally sold at tourist sites. Um, and what was interesting was the depth of the Grand Canyon or Mickey Mouse's house or what, what, whatever. The, the, the difference, and, and this is something I've come to, is 
when we look at the world, we are not conscious of depth in the same way we are when we look at a 3D image, where we're really experiencing the space between objects. Where we look at reality, as it were, um, our 3D vision just gives us uh, uh, aids to navigate the world uh, in terms of what's closer and further away. Um, so it is a different experience, even though we say it's three-dimensional, it is its own aesthetic. That's um, a really interesting point. I've never thought about that, but it immediately makes sense now you say it. Because, you know, I, I know, for example, that you know, when you the simple act of, we think it's simple, of catching a ball when you're playing a game of catch, you know, your brain is doing really complex and sophisticated calculus to calculate the trajectory of the ball and make sure, you know, and, and what have you. And all of that, you know, completely unconsciously, you know, that's monkey brain stuff, isn't it? That's that's not higher brain stuff. So yeah, that's a really interesting point because for me, I can look, at, right, looking straight ahead at the moment, I'm, I'm stood in front of a desk, on a microphone very close to my face, then a laptop screen, then a camera in a, slightly further back. But I don't, uh, yeah, and yeah, there's depth, but I'm not seeing it as depth. I'm just seeing it as stuff, you know, which is now, very different from when you see a, a, right. a photograph or a film in 3D, which, which is, it's, it's, I think what maybe it does then is that it raises the, your awareness or your processing of the 3D nature of the image to your higher brain, perhaps. The space in between. I think if you're looking at an image of what you are seeing in front of you, a 3D image, you would be very conscious of where the edge of the computer monitor ends, where the camera is in the background and the space between them with this kind of urge to maybe fit your hand around it and dive into I was, that. I was, I was wondering, I mean, yes, it's a different experience and, and I don't really, yeah, I, it, feel, it feels a, a bit gimmicky to me. Um, I haven't seen that many movies in the, in the cinema in 3D, but of course I have those theme park uh, experiences, theme park uh, shows in 3D. Um, I've had a Viewmaster as a kid, and uh, but those were always very like limited experiences. They were always kind of just just once in a month or something. Really, really rare, even rarer most of the time. So I was wondering um, if if. If it became more like a daily occurrence, a daily thing to watch things in 3D, if that would kind of be normalized in our brains, because I mean, I, I had the Oculus Quest um, experience and being in there in in the beginning for the first few hours felt like, whoa, 3D and everything is mm -hmm. as depth and stuff. And then after a while, it became a bit more normal. I I went and played some online games quite frequently and those then just became like, another reality that was kind of interchangeable with the real one. So the question is, if, if, if getting used to it will change things. Well, I mean, I think that is a fantastic point to make. Uh, whereas, our, um, and, and I think that as we get used to different ways of seeing or different experiences, that normalization happens in our brain. So that, that describes, or when people lose 3D image, when they're just looking through one eye, they get used to judging spatial interaction uh, with different techniques in your right. brain. Um, it's not that everything becomes two-dimensional and flat. So th our brain really is what connects us uh, to an understanding of depth. Uh, but as I start to kind of focus more on, on the artistic or the creative elements of 3D image making, uh, I will hearken back again to my own experience. Um, in, in my kind of uh, early days as an artist uh, in Toronto, um, you know, Canada, like Germany, has a, a, a much more open and inviting uh, way to fund artists and, and young artists' intentions, and you could apply for government grants and all of that stuff. Well. Uh, a group of us, three of us, uh, got together and we, we managed to get uh, what was then called the Canada Council Grant. And we bought ourselves, I, th <laughs> I think, a $200,000 laser. 
a steel table about six inches, which we floated. And we began making holograms. And this is uh, laser lit holograms. Um, and we did it basically, there, it was before the internet, by reading papers, coding our own emulsion, setting trial and error, basically. And we created really amazing things where you set up a plate, you use the beam splitter to split the, uh, the laser, a very powerful red laser, which would shine some of its light split on the object and some of it on the um, uh, glass plate coated. And then you develop it when you then re focus the laser on the plate itself without the object, the object would appear just as clear as when you saw it on the table. Pretty astounding. So we did that. Uh, we managed to open a museum of holography with some, uh, or be part of that. It was happening in New York. We had a show, we opened it, and some of our stuff ended up in the Museum of Modern Art as well. And this, this really gave way to what we would now call white light holography, which doesn't require lasers and it requires reflectivity. And it's often used uh, as a security thing on your credit cards or uh, documents itself. Um, but it never really caught, you know, it never really caught the zeitgeist in terms of creativity. The other ways that I explored 3D is I used to have a 3D slide camera and Kodak used to make Kodachrome or be able to process Kodachrome with a split image. In other words, you'd get back a slide with two images and you were able to project it with a 3D projector and Polaroid glasses or polarized lenses, one where the image was going vertically and one horizontally. I'm holding up my hand and demonstrating that. Uh, and, and those would kind of create the uh, complementary in the image that was projected. And those would be very astonishing because you could project them very big. And we used to do this at galleries. That's, uh, that, sounds inter that sounds very interesting. So the, is that one image or two images you're projecting there? One image, <coughs> well, you're but, but projecting Polaroid. two, but they are, because of the projection, you can bring them together and adjust the parallax so the those in the audience with glasses would be seeing a single image, not unlike a projected film in 3D. So wow. okay. that was part of our, our, our kind of process. Um, oh, just two years ago, I had a show here uh, in Los Angeles uh, of my work and Half the show was a uh, very, very large black and white lenticular prints. Lenticular prints are, and these were like 20 by 30 black and white contrasty lenticulars. Um, not easy to get made in any kind of quality. That's another. Yeah, they usually come in, in tourist postcard size usually. That's right. Yeah. That's right. There, a lenticular print is the kind of thing that you see in tourist shops where, you know, somebody is smiling and frowning. Uh, somebody is beautiful in a skull. Uh, happy Christmas, you know, you loser when you flip it. It's just a way of changing the image or kind of some little three dimensional uh, image. And it's used by kind of, you know, in, in the, the 10 second version is you slice and dice. A, a, an image and then you mount a very specific lenses at very specific um, uh, distances uh, and the end result is uh, a kind of 3D image. Um, to do this in a large 20 by 30 black and white was an experiment that, that took many, many months and working with uh, a, a, some really spectacular printers uh, here in Los Angeles, which I found quite by accident because my first piece was done in the Midwest. It was very difficult to find people who wanted to participate in taking what is a commercial or bus shelter gimmick and turn it into art. And those those pieces sold out, as you can imagine there. And I framed them with mats. So when you just stood in front of them quietly, they would look like a black and white image. 
When you but moved, as soon as everything you moved, changed. Yes, <laughs> everything changed. So that was a, a fun experiment. But I, but getting back to what we can do, you don't need a three D camera to take three D pictures. All you really need to do is move your camera from right to left and keep it in a reasonably um, solid uh, line. Uh, you could, which you could adjust later and then combine the images using your favorite uh, uh, photo editing technique. These are often can they're often printed as what we call anaglyphs. Anaglyphs are something that uh, everyone can can do because they basically are a a way of separating the right and left by using um, color. Um, and when you look at these images using those glasses, you get a, a, a beautiful 3D image. And often those things are and have been used in a gimmicky way. However, last year at the LA County Museum, there was a show, a 3D show, which was very, very impressive. Some of the most impressive was a massive, probably six by four inch paper print two of them. I want to say that Thomas DeMann did it, but I, I, I may be wrong. So please don't quote me. But it, it would be someone like that. Um, and it was a model of a crater anaglyph hanging on the wall. And there were glasses beside the picture that you could pick up and shoot. And it was absolutely staggering. The depth was only uh, a few inches to our brain. But it had a, a great power um, that was unlike anything that I had seen. Um, I had done a series and have done a series of anaglyphs. I've never printed them or published them, but it's something that I have explored. And I've put a few images up on our Discord channel, which we can get to a little later. And then finally, uh, there are cameras that you could buy still, uh, one of which my favorite is something called a FinePix Fuji. I'm holding up the box now. This is a 3D camera. Oh, you've actually got one. Oh, yeah. I, show, I, show, I, show it I again. Have... Show it again on the screen. Here's the box. Oh. I thought so much about buying one of these <laughs> when they were at, when they came out. I, I really did. Honestly, this is one of my favorite cameras in the universe. Uh, the quality is great. It shoots in a format called MPO, which is which one uh, can't using the right uh, software easily separate the black, uh, the left and the right images, adjust uh, the fine elements of parallax, which you can do on the camera. It has a screen you do not need glasses to look at that gives you a 3D image on the screen. You can then adjust the parallax and by parallax, it's how uh, how much distance between the uh, point of focus and the distance between your eyes, which sometimes can result in eye strain if it's not dialed in perfectly. And uh, that's why a lot of 3D movies are very tiring to the eyes because our eyes are just constantly trying to adjust. Um, but this camera yeah, I guess, is... I guess it's like a pair of binoculars. That's why binoculars bend in the middle, That's isn't right. it? Because you it's need exactly to get them right. to be the, 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 yeah. the width of your eyes. So the fine picks is, is something that, that is great. You can still find Let's them Let's actually bring on, that up uh, right now. Let's bring up our Discord. I did think, I did think so, while you're doing that, I did think so much about buying one of these they, they, there we when go. they came out. It was, so uh, it's fun. Incredible. By the way, this is yeah. this is a place. Uh, if 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 anyone out there has has still has questions <laughs> about what this Discord thing is, this is what it is. On it's on the screen right now in the video version. Uh, so you put those up in in showcase. Uh, yeah, we have a bit of a squirrel infestation on <laughs> on the channel right now. That's um, we do. Uh, but there so are your anaglyphic old Star Trek jokes this week. There are your anaglyphic photos. Let me try with my uh, anaglyphic class. By the way, is that is, is the is the blue and red on which sides they are? Is that is there a firm definition where this has to be? Oh yeah, this is. Uh, you can adjust. You can. Uh, uh, I will kind of demonstrate. You can adjust them in any way you want. On, on yeah, just things. just wondering if if I go out and buy 
red blue glasses will i get you ones that see. will work everywhere uh, is there a, uh, pretty is well like a they're standard convention they are standard yeah okay. yeah yeah, we, I was going to say, actually, for those of the listeners that don't recognize the word anaglyph, um, but, but maybe uh, ha have seen glasses that have one red eye and one green eye or blue eye. That's what they um, are. Yeah, th that's, that's what they are. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, uh, uh, and the, the image, of course, without those glasses, what you see is color fringing at the edges of things. Yes. And it's that color fringi fringing that, that, um, that's that something. Sets if you like the distance at which you perceive that object in the there's image there's something be. wild about having the discord open scrolling through photos and having some of them pop well back into the screen kind of 3d-ish uh, that's a, that's an interesting thing yes like little, <laughs> like little <laughs> windows going going that's right, that's in right. there i mean it's so tiny but um... yeah you can you can see it from your screen but uh, the viewers on the video version can certainly do so get your anaglyph glasses have a look um, now, just note that these I've reduced these in quality, but the uh, the quality that I have on uh, on Photoshop uh, is probably they're probably about twenty megapixels at three hundred DPI, and I've printed them rather big, and they are beautiful. They are so. Just so beautiful. tell us tell us how you would make one of these because you know, this this of of interest to our listeners and viewers maybe, and 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 certainly you've piqued my interest today. How how would I go about making one I'll of give, these images? I'll give you a very simple way with no extra equipment needed, um, except if you don't have a rail. <laughs> <laughs> but I know you have a rail. I don't know that. Uh, a rail, as in you mean a rail, as in what you would use for a video camera to manage the movement of a video camera. Uh, well, yes, uh, they, to they range out from two cameras. Pretty much. Or they range from six feet to seven inches. Uh, they often have a rotating platform to uh, to maintain the focus point as the camera moves. Uh, they're not expensive, but if you if you uh, identified an object, put your camera on it, shot the right side, slid the camera to the left side, shot it again, that gives you your left and right. Uh, there's and does it, much. And it, does it help to, ha to for the, the distance of the movement to be roughly the distance between your eyes, for example? Does that help? Is it, or is it, it helps. Uh, but depending on the distance, if you were shooting a mountain, uh, you would need to move maybe 20 feet to yeah, get any okay. distance. Yes, because you need to be able to generate that parallax. Right. Uh, yeah, so okay. that's a trial and error thing. I'm sure there's scientific papers written about exactly what, what uh, you know, how many feet you are. I, I've always just done it by feel. But uh, if you take two shots pointed at the same image um, and moved one left and one right, brought that into Photoshop and started to move them together and then uh, co basically colored one as red and one is green. Uh, you could slide them together and end up with quite a beautiful, I've simplified it somewhat, mm. but there are many, many, um, I guess, DIY spots on YouTube that would, uh, you know, give you some, you know, good insights onto how to do that with yeah. just a rail system. Or, I want to say or, there or should, there should a small... be a way of doing this as an app as well these days with depth sensors and stuff like that. Ah, on phones. funny should you should one. say that. There... Oh, oh, okay. Sorry, I, I should have read the show notes. No, I, I did not. I did not put any 3D notes in it. I'm, you know, I, I'm kicking myself for not doing it. But uh, do I have? To... Yeah, here, look at that. 3D depth cam, fuse cam, I. Uh, what's it? i3d stereo uh i think that's one that is interesting um oh, this is okay. one that so, i say so, so there might be apps out there uh, that people could try this stuff out with then uh, all right and right. Uh, these are not things that i've used very much but there are apps that will enable a left right uh shot but they do require some process do you know what i i remember some years ago when it first came out playing with google cardboard 
which was a, a system quite quite actually made of cardboard, uh, yeah. where you could use your you could slot your phone into uh, into a cardboard box, and it came with two little plastic lenses, and it would give you a, basically yeah. a VR effect. I bet there'd be something like that out there that you could uh, you could yeah. try this stuff with. Well, there are, and there there are even kind of plastic versions of the same for you know with adjustable lenses. So uh, you know, getting back to it, is three D um a creative tool yes is it something that you want to um explore it's fun i would say it's <laughs> there's a novelty to it it's fun i think it becomes very interesting in taking what uh, has been seen as novel techniques and subverting them into something that really gives the viewer a second look at it so that this novel technique disappears and you're experiencing an image in a new way. So, so let me ask you a question around this then. So h however many years on it is since you did a holography gallery exhibition. Um, uh, and, you know, do you looking back, do you think that part of the the way that was received, I hope successfully, but part of the way it was right. received was based around the novelty factor. If you did the similar thing today, would it be considered art? uh is there is is it is is it the fact that you, you you print it big and stick it on a wall in a gallery is that the thing that makes it art well that's a bigger question it is uh, but it, I, it is that's a bigger question i mean i could that's an I entire could episode uh, <laughs> it, it is well let me try and narrow it down. let me try and narrow it down then because yeah that, that yeah that's a, that's a, almost a philosophical question isn't it or at the very least a cynical economics based question yeah um the is is it um if if you were making let's say a, a six foot by four foot anaglyph print or something or or a six foot by four foot what a cut lenticular print yeah um and uh that was in a gallery is it, do, do you think you could get away with just having the image be any old rubbish or would it still need to be no actually an artistic creation in its own yeah, right i think that the the creative process is how to fuse the image and the technique so that one can not imagine one without the other. In other words, that the intention of the image through that technique creates the experience that is unique to that uh, image and time to experience it. Uh, I, okay. I think that's true of every technique that we okay. employ. No, thank you. That that helps because, as you know, I'm a bit of a dabbler and I don't have any artistic education as such. And so I do I do genuinely struggle with these things sometimes to understand what is the difference between you know, the toy and the art. <laughs> I say it, it's intention. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what What is the outcome? What, what do you want to achieve? Certainly in quite blurry lines in between. Yes. Uh, and, and it's those blurry lines that I think some of the most exciting things uh, are, 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 are discovered because uh, it's those mistakes. Or I, I remember the very first time I did a, a flip lenticular, which is uh, one that just changes images. And uh, it was a, uh, a koi pond, black and white. So the water seems black, but under the surface of the water and you see leaves and uh, branches and twigs, you see big koi. But in each image, the koi is just moving ever so slightly with one just coming up to the water to grab a piece of food. So the ring of the water expands. So the image is still, there's very, very little movement, the leaves and stones, the, the light. But as you move, you see the fish just adjust and the, the, a little ripple of the water move out. That's a very specific experience. How many, how many individual frames can you put into one of these lenticulars? Depends on the lens, well, I guess, right? Well, uh, funny you should ask. Just excuse me for a second. <laughs> okay, Jeremiah oh, is leaving, was gone. leaving the recording <laughs> spot and picking up something. Uh, this is an image. Okay, let me let me bring you up bigger on the screen okay. here. So yep. this is me as Chuck Close, right? 
Uh, this you can't really tell, but this is a 3D lenticular. I, well, I can if you turn see, it slightly, sort of. we can see a change. Yes. So, so, yes. so what that if what that looks like to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that and you get these on kids' magazines sometimes. It's an image printed on what looks to be a, a ridged surface, and as yes. you turn the angle, turn the image, the angle of view ch changes what you see. And that it's ridged surface is the lenses. Yeah. It's not printed on a lens, uh, on a ridge surface. It's printed on a flat surface. Yes. Right. The lenses are applied to it very okay. carefully and very specifically. And choosing the lenses, because there are 20, 30, 40, 60, even okay. 80 in terms of, of, and that will uh, have an effect on how close the viewer is meant to be in right. experiencing the image. Oh, okay. But this, this image, which is just the uh, Grayson, who, who is the printer, uh, it's his uh, business card. But <laughs> nice. the image itself is about five feet by four feet. It's massive, like a Chuck Close painting. And for, uh, for the record, the business case is slightly smaller than that <laughs> business card. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I believe that uh, he had, I know, I don't believe, I know, he had uh, Chuck Close sit rigidly in a seat, holding still, not unlike getting a daguerreotype done. And he had a very long rail, which I've seen, showed me, about, I don't know, 12, 15 feet, and uh, a Canon 5D. And he literally there must have been 60 images. He just had him stay very still. And, and uh, he did about 60 images. So that this little images is made up of 60. Okay. Separate images combined. And uh, it, it, it is a That's, deal, but it's a very, That takes quite some dedication. Powerful. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah, I, oh, yeah. I certainly don't have a 15 foot rail. Uh, but does the, does the camera, when you make that then, does the camera have to turn rotate on its uh, 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 it, uh as it moves along the rail it, it does most it, of these it, it, rails otherwise half the time it wouldn't be put it wouldn't be pointing at the subject would it <laughs> most of these rails uh including my little six inch ones have adjustments to keep the focal point yep. you could you can make it parallel or you can make it uh focal point yeah i i uh, used yeah, a slider okay, i yeah. used a slider that had a little automatically rotating platform on it where you put the camera so you could set yeah. it so you could set it to to always point at a certain point you could you had a parallel right. slider but it would always point the camera at the same yeah. uh spot i yeah. think and most that, of them have that the, most as long as you get that. the focal plane in yeah. the right place yeah. it exactly. all, yeah so uh you know 3d is something one could explore with cheap picture, you know, cheap cameras. You could do it with your own. It's it's quite fun experimenting with these things. Anaglyphs are the cheapest way to go. Uh, I've uh, selected as part of my picks a couple of uh, my favorite little software pieces that um, you could use to either take apart what we call an MPO file. So it'll separate that file into left and right and then reconstitute it if you want. Um, I just think with the advent of LiDAR scanning, your, your expertise, Adrian, <laughs> that we're going to be seeing some new forms of integrating LiDAR imaging and 3D imaging uh, that we're not seeing yet, but I think that's coming to the phone. All right. Uh, yeah, we, we definitely need to, to get to that. Definitely. I'm looking forward to that. So what does that mean, mean for the future of photography? Do we have a... It means that we'll continually be distracted by 3D. <laughs> it does. Do you know, we'll, it reminds me... I'll say in five years, we'll probably talk about this differently because by that time, we'll have those devices and it will be much more normal, regular occurrence for us to see things in 3D. Like... I, and, and I'm intrigued. Well, we'll come back when we come back to it. I must. We must remember to check against the question you asked earlier, Chris, which is: Is it that our brains are just used to seeing things in a certain way? Yeah, which is no. the yeah a, a contemporary uh, example being you know watching something in 24 frames a second versus 60. One of them looks like a movie. The other one looks like a home video. Yeah, it's. Yeah. 
for for me, I think it's it's it really comes down to what you're used to. But we'll uh, well, that means we'll have to continue making the show for at least five years to find out and talk <laughs> about it here on the air. I hope um, nobody holds us to account. <laughs> let's let's go to the picks of the week, and I will do the first one. Let me just switch back to from our Discord to the browser. There's the browser. Um, nothing to do with 3D. Nothing to do with stereoscopic vision, but uh, Affinity or Serif, the company that does Affinity Photo and the other, like, let's say Adobe Design Air and stuff, but yep. Adobe Competition products. Um, they've just done the same thing they've done at the beginning of the pandemic, which is they are offering a 90 day free trial, which is great. So you get three months to uh, test stuff. And I'm a fan of their products. And they offer 50% off all apps right now. So, uh, if you're and they're not expensive in the first place, are and, they? And so. they're and they're non and they're non subscription. They are just like you buy them and you have them. So, um, I'm a fan. Can so you, I, th I think this is awesome. I mean, when, on the rare occasion I do need serious firepower, um, uh, Affinity Photo on yeah. the iPad is is really good. Yeah, the ability to draw with your finger or a pen straight on the screen and what you're seeing and all of that for uh, is it forty dollars or euros yeah, or something it's, it's not it's, an expensive and now 50 percent off so yeah no no can excuse. i ask can i ask both of you what uh what can this do that photoshop can't do or what does it do better than it photoshop because it's more, more modern in terms of how it works um i like the way it's integrated with each other so switching being in the in the vector program and switching to uh, to the pixel tools from the from their Photoshop equivalent is just one mouse click. Um, it is well, as I said, it's it's a, it's non subscription, which means you have it. <laughs> you, you don't pay every month, <laughs> and um, it's fast. Their stuff is incredibly fast, yeah. and it, it's very consistent over the different platforms. So. Um, C certainly for me when I made my choice which was a little while ago uh, there was no equivalently powerful editor on an iPad um, now I understand Photoshop is, is there now and is improving um, but at the time if you wanted a powerful editor on an iPad you had to buy this it was the only choice so yeah the, the Affinity Designer their, their like uh, illustrator kind of tool is now just 27.99 euros See, I will, I will admit to That's having incredible. having it on my iPad, but I've. This yeah, is but you, sound weird, but, but I've never used it. <laughs> you live in the Photoshop or in the in the Adobe universe, I, and uh, those tools do for you what you need, and uh, you use them professionally. So, of course, you I just know how to use them. So, and you know, and and them. muscle memory. But uh, I've taken the time and uh, relearned a couple of those things. Not too much. It's very similar. And I've, yeah, the only, the only Adobe product I use regularly is Lightroom because there still is no equivalent for that. Yeah, I f if I'd say that if there was one thing that I, I think um, uh, I wish would change in Affinity Photo, I think it would be that it was slightly less like Photoshop. Yeah, but I appreciate that in order to make any headway in the market at all, they had to provide something I that like, was very easy for Photoshop users to use. I like the I like the the the, the paradigm, the usage paradigm, which is a bit more, for me, a bit more logical than Photoshop. But again, that's probably probably personal preference. Let's get also on. Sorry. Also, Chris, ph Photoshop is like 25 years old and they build legacy on legacy. Oh, on legacy, it's so. it's yeah. And and of course, of, of course, Photoshop has tools that F Affinity Photo doesn't have. But for my for all for, for all I use it for, it covers that and way more. So anyway, mm. 90 days trial, check it out. Um, and we're not being paid to say that, by the way. No, just good pick, though, Chris. I, I like, like it. I approve. Good pick. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Adrian, you brought us... Um, let me bring this up here. You brought us this. What is this? <laughs> it looks okay, weird. Okay, so... <laughs> it is, it looks is delicious. Weird. So, <laughs> uh, well, uh, so this cake. is a... a this is a, a, a 3D model image. 
So, um, so what you're showing us on the screen now is uh, a I can 3D actually image move it. It is actually three. You can move it. There you go. Uh, that I made using my telephone. <laughs> as I can you, even as zoom in and and, yes. and and show how many holes are in there. Yes. Well, this is me starting to play with the lidar <laughs> scanner. So, we're, given that we had a, a a show based around 3D imagery. This to me is is a it, clearly it's not a, a, a photographic technique per, per se, uh, but it's more of a hybrid technique. So what the phones do is that they you, you switch them into a capture mode for, for a 3D image. They take tons and tons of photographs and they also use the LiDAR to build up the best depth map that they can build up. Uh, and then um, very much in the way that people have done since the early days of games like Doom, uh, it's texture mapping. You know, you have a th you have a plane in a 3D space and you have to plaster a texture across it. Um, and, and that's how we create a coloured 3D image that you can move around. Now, it's great fun um, and experimental and it's definitely a first gen product, if that. <laughs> <laughs> because what we're seeing here, uh, so, so the, the image in question uh, is is simply a tabletop with a, a plant in a pot on it. If I remember correctly, it was a rosemary plant um, because that's our kitchen table. And <laughs> I think I just grabbed the first plant I could. Um, so, you know, what you're seeing here is that it, it a table itself, actually, it's, it's managed to create roughly speaking uh, a flat single plane for, for that although because it's the way it scans it's actually stitched together multiple flat, flat planes so it's not quite like how the table would look but clearly it falls down completely if you want to zoom into the plant for a second it falls down completely when you try and take a, uh, make an image of something like a plant which is mostly empty space i i would have you... a story around this. sorry jeremiah you go ahead i, I just had a quick question for you but because this is rendered in 3D, a little different tech, uh, definition of the 3D we've been talking about, but because it is, could you travel? In other words, if you um, uh, looked at this from both left eye and right eye, could you capture a still from both the right and the left, just sliding, doing a virtual rail on it mm. and then uh, create a, uh, a, th a actual 3D anagraph so, of so, it. So, so that, that's a really interesting question. You possibly could. I mean, when you use the scanning app, it will cut when you when you finished a scan and it um, uh, and it pops back down know, to a, a list of scans you've made. It will say something like this scan has you know 400,000 faces and you know it's captured 300 photographic images to use as texture uh, uh, and stuff like that so yeah you know, i guess you could unbundle that um it's probably a bit harder uh to do than actually just to, to set out to do what you've just described the other thing the, the other thing is and this is an interesting part of presentation uh, as well is that um, whilst you can present it in a, in a as a 3D model, so um, that you know, the app can um, generate lots of different formats of 3D models, as if you was uh, you know, a, a compression codec or something, you know, lots of different opportunities. Um, it's actually difficult to the apps I found don't do a render. So, so I've had to capture the 2D thing by simply doing screenshots, by moving the 3D model around, and then and then doing a screenshot. So, there are some. Um, well, you're not going to get challenges good, with it. You're so not going to be able to do a good render with the thing. The thing I, I wanted to to, to to the story I wanted to tell is along those lines, and um, there is an app, an iPhone app that does well. Don't don't ask me about the name. I forgot what it's what is named, but it was a. A year ago maybe um which does that but it does it photogrammetically it does use ah, okay. photogrammetry so you take a lot of photos of a space of something and it will figure out the relation of things just by seeing what's the same on which on, on two pictures and then it'll create a 3d thing like that um it's it's definitely takes longer it's not as precise um as with the lidar but it it worked, and what I did is I created. And unfortunately, it's it's in a, on a platform, so it's not like you don't get the file. You just just view it on the platform. But what mm. I did is I, I, 
I, I made a 3D representation of our living room, which, like the entire room, of the outside walls, the sofa, the, the table, whatever's in there. And I, create, I recreated that space, and then I went into that space using the Oculus Quest. <laughs> so yeah. I overlaid it over the actual living room at the actual size, and then I walked around in that 3D scan <laughs> space, which was, of course, like your picture here, very <laughs> not perfect, uh, B- interesting, bitty, bitty yeah, yeah. yes, bitty, and and it was it was it was this weird sensation of being in the exact same room. Everything's at the exact same place, so I didn't have to worry about stumbling over a, a chair or something because the, the the actual chair was there where the 3D weird chair was. The table was there, the sofa was there, so I could sit on the sofa in that 3D space and it <laughs> gave me, it was such an, a weird, strange sensation because I could touch those weird splotchy things and they were real. So, uh, yeah. Now that's that's interesting. Yeah, that's could you yeah, float? very, very geeky. Well done. Could you float? <laughs> could you? Could you fly through the Of course, room? of course you can. Yes, yes, yes. But I, I deliberately made it uh, register with the actual room so that I could move in uh, around in it and um yeah quite of a qu- quite a bit of a mind trick there quite a weird yeah that that's thing. interesting so I think there's a lot to come in this space I mean this <laughs> is my pick of the week because I've enjoyed playing with it I know there are more sophisticated tools that have been around for a very long time that would make better inf- yeah better capture of the uh, uh, of the of the environment and then better rendering of it I'd, in, I'd in say for space. architects this future bodes spectacularly well well i was thinking more about you know um because it's about as as chris often says it's about the for me it's about the democratization of this technology so i mean you know, you've had you know s- specific hardware for available for many years and so a very sophisticated yeah. software that will do all of that thing to pro you know to, to uh, you know commercially presentable levels of quality but you know what if you're wanting to buy a new house yeah. What if you you, you go around? Yes, I remember. I, we've lived at this house I, we live in. Um, I remember coming to view this before we bought it, and I had a two G little tiny Sony candy bar um, phone at the time because it was before smartphones really took off. And I got some very grainy photos of it. You know, and I had to hold my hand right up in the corner of the room so that I could get something <laughs> that showed how the room worked. You know, what I'd like to be able to actually, I. I don't want to move house. Um, that's too much like hard work. But what I'd like to be able to do, or, other, or like for other people to be able to do, is to use this technology to go around, just stand in the corner and go zip, 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 and 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 be done with their phone, not even needing a Theta 360 camera or anything like oh, that. Oh, re- realtors know. will will be all over that kind of a technology when it becomes more available at uh, at. Well, I, I guess I guess the introduction of lidar in phones is probably going to usher in quite some changes yeah. in those web pages. It, re- it really is um, yeah. really also, is the first gen, t- per, first, first gen product at the moment. When, when phones can render, in other words, when their GPU speeds start to get yeah. a little more aggressive, you're going to be able to uh, experience a place, you walk in, and if you're with a designer and architect yourself, you're going to be able to go, see this space? This is what we can do with it. Yes. And it will be photorealistic. We're, we're not that far from that. So your picks of the week, Jeremiah, My are software. Picks. You know, I picked, yeah, I picked a couple uh, in the theme that we are um, exploring. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, these are two of my favorites. One is Stereo Maker. I don't think it's supported. And one is yes. Anaglyph Maker, which I love. Stereo I Master here, fantastic. yes. Fantastic. Uh, application. Uh, Stereo Master is uh, old in the tooth, but I, I haven't found anything to replace it. Uh, but and they do different things. Uh, worth they're not expensive, and they're a lot of fun to play with. Um, and then um, Anaglyph Maker, which I I adore. I think that's quite fun because you can move things in and out of Photoshop, and it's just a way of compiling. Your left and right, and adjusting only windows the though of your focal point. No, I, I have it for Mac. So oh, there's a I, Mac I version. Okay, okay, good. The last, the last. 
Yeah. So, so these, yeah. so okay, so these are desktop applications that allow you to take two images and make yeah. uh, an anaglyph from them. Yeah. Ah, okay. Good. All right. So it's, I have to it's play all out there, and readily available. Do you, we should have we should have a listener challenge at some point with some of these technologies, shouldn't we? Just well, to, to to get people to play with them. I mean, I have anaglyph glasses. Jeremiah has anaglyph glasses. Um, Adrian, where are yours? I'm sure I had. I think I think the last set I had came off the cover of 2000 AD when I was about 11 years old. Um, uh, but the, you're you're just I, not a real just nerd. You're just not a real 3D I, nerd. I have a three I have a 3D television. Uh, not okay. because I wanted one, but because by the at the time I bought that particular television in this country, you couldn't buy a TV that wasn't 3D. Um, it came with some glasses, um, uh, which after several years, I just simply binned. Um, there, there, there isn't any need for a 3D Those are poor in this country. There's too. nothing to watch for one thing. And we look cool. There you go. Um, you do. I think that brings us to the end of a wonderful episode. Thanks, Jeremiah, for all this. Um, we're, of Jeremiah course, now online. looks like he should be in ZZ Top. To yeah. yeah, well, I'm still working on that beard. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Take that as a compliment. <laughs> exactly. We're, of course, Please, on... Did. The, yeah, I can't have to keep did. trimming it. Yeah. Okay, okay you, you, you can read. Everyone can read. The show notes are, are down in the description. We're online. And, of course, um, tell everyone about it. Right? Yep. Yep. Okay, until next Here time, we are. everyone, Discord is fun. take care, and meet us on Discord with cool glasses. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.